All right, everybody. Well, we are so excited today and honored to be meeting with the team from the uh, U.S. Latino Digital Humanity Center um, or US De USLDH Center. Um, I think that their work is one of the most inspiring examples of what can be done with DH in the field. And I'm so excited for all of you to get to know their work. Um, so we have um, three team members here today. Um, as usual, their links are in uh, your in the course or their bios are in the course site. But today we have Carolina Villaruel, Gabriela Baiza Ventura, and Lorena Gotro. Um, so thank you so much, all of you guys, for being here with us today. Um, thank so you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much. Um, so to get started, um, can you please introduce the USLD Center and your work? Sure. Um, so the USLDH Center uh, began approximately seven or eight years ago when uh, Carolina and I uh, decided to figure out that the, the one of the ways in which we could extend the work of the Recovering the U.S. Hispanic Literary Heritage Program and also our Arte Publico Press into uh, larger communities and, and more communities of, of, um, of practice who were using uh, Latin, US Latino related materials was to begin to uh, apply the digital humanities to the archival material that we have in house. And so we, we began to explore what were the opportunities that were made available to community members, to researchers, uh, to use some of the, the materials that we had um, in the past, um, you know, Arte Publico and the recovery program stems from a, from a, a position of, uh, of social justice to create a space for U.S. Latinos to uh, make their materials present and, and you know, and publish within the, the space of the United States, right? In the past, a lot of the, our recovery work material was primarily published as a, a like a, as, as a print document so we would you know we we published a lot of uh, scholarly editions that included you know like an original manuscript with a translation and then some archival materials as an added as an addenda and so we knew that the the opportunity to make uh, a lot of these more of these resources available to our larger community would definitely be to try to explore um you know other opportunities with the digital humanities so um, the idea for the center is still based on this idea that we are wanting to continue to preserve and disseminate and make available uh, um, and, and discover um, Latin, U.S. Latino related materials that are, you know, in, in different places all over the United States to document the written legacy and presence of Latinos in the United States from the colonial period up until the 1980s. So we created this center that would uh, provide, it's a, it's a physical space that can provide uh, training to uh, students at all levels, but also community members um, who want to learn about, you know, how to use uh, digital humanities, how to, you know, uh, do, uh, you know, archival work, how to even like begin to document their, their family history, right? Or their, their you know, or to start to create like an uh, archive for, of their family, of their family materials. Um, and the center was also created also not only well, to train uh, the, the, those communities, but also to train other like faculty who didn't have the time to dedicate, you know, time to learning about digital humanities. Um, and so, you know, we work with a wide range of, of, of learners. Um, we, we um, um, so we created this space. Uh, we applied for a grant from the Mellon Foundation that allowed us, gave us the opportunity to visit different centers across the United States to, to determine like what, like the type of center that we would model ourselves after. And so we, we build on the work uh, from uh, communities such as uh, color conventions, right? Who are doing a lot, of, have been doing a lot of important and valuable work in, in, uh, in building and centering their, their communities. Uh, the Schomburg Center, uh, the myth, uh, the myths, uh, digital humanity center are are great examples for us at home at uh, at the University of Maryland. Um, but also, um, we feel that like there are other things that our own center offers, which you know, taking all of these um, concepts and this idea of of helping uh, center our community 
This is something that we have been doing through the recovery work and also through Arte Publico Press. But um, we are very conscious about using software, for instance, that is free, that is readily available, right? Uh, we are, uh, we don't have, uh, at this point, we don't have the privilege of, of dedicating a lot of time to create our own software, right? Or our own platforms. Uh, and we want to make sure that the that the software that we use is, is software that can be easily um, made uh, available and seen through a telephone, all right? Uh, so because we know that like a lot of our communities are using their telephones uh, as like the 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 uh, the device that they will use to visualize and to see like the the materials. So uh, a lot of the different things that we are doing with uh, the digital humanities archives and in the in the um, the activities that we have at our center, we do a lot of workshops. Uh, we do uh, a speaker series. Uh, we did a very successful uh, speaker series on social justice that continues to 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 uh, to this day. Um, we provide uh, grants and aid to bring in scholars and um, scho scholars uh, scholars in the sense of like the traditional scholar who's working for, you know, towards tenure, but then also community members who bring their own, you know, knowledge and, and you know, they, uh, I mean, and, I, and I'm sorry, but I, I shouldn't have said their own knowledge, but they bring knowledge in the same way that uh, scholars, you know, bring that traditional or formal, you know, university type knowledge. We, we we bring in um, community members so that they can also receive some of the training that we provide uh, as they receive the grant you know the the grants in aid that they can use to create uh, a digital humanities uh, project a lot of times they create you know a map or a timeline that begins to to serve as a, as a seed of of the of the work right that features and that showcases how they're uh, centering in 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 uh, and working with archival materials, or you know, uh, or, yeah, ma ma archival materials that are telling a, a story about Latinos in the U.S. from a specific uh, community or a specific time period. Um, what else am I leaving out? Um, and so, um, so th these are some of the ideas for for the center. The, the other major thing that we wanted to do with the center, aside from providing all of that teaching, was to build a community. Uh, a practice in around digital humanities in U.S. Latino uh, work, and so we created uh, the hashtag, right? The hashtag USLDH, and also we created a database in uh, an Excel sheet to begin to document all the U.S. Latino related digital humanities projects that were taking that were ongoing across the nation, and uh, and that allowed us to um, visualize for different foundations in our community the different activity that is happening all over the US in, in terms of, in relation to digital humanities and, and to realize that we, you know, we've known that we're not, we're not the only ones working on this. And so we wanted to make sure that, you know, that there was a community of, a community of practice that people are working towards um, documenting and, and making, you know, archive, archival materials available through uh, virtual spaces. Um, uh, and also to identify uh, other scholars, right, who could potentially work and, and uh, present and, and be be included or be invited to do presentations and you know and be keynote speakers, etc., um, to speak about you know about doing doing this work. So it was a, this whole idea of building this community that uh, represents you know U.S. Latino digital humanities across the nation. Mm -hmm. uh, our final goal with the with creating the center is to create, you know, become uh, a digital hub for where hopefully we can uh, document all these uh, digital humanities uh, activity that is happening all over the U.S. Uh, in a space that can uh, hopefully save a copy or document, right, this this activity that is happening so that it does it so that it is, it is not lost and, you know, and, you know, and, uh, and forgotten or, or and or, or erased. And so, that's like a long-term goal. You know, we function out of the University of Houston. You know, we have uh, sustainability through the University of Houston through the recovery program. And so it's, you know, it's it's this, the, the idea for the center is to provide all of this support so that we can uh, train and, 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 uh, and establish the field of US Latino digital humanities from this pers uh, perspective where we are centered 
on on working uh, with the, with uh, Latino archives from a position of power, where where uh, we 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 see the the archival materials and the representatives from those archival materials as uh, producers of knowledge who are working at the same level, right alongside the 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 researcher who is creating that digital humanities uh, project. So. Am I leaving anything else? I think I was very complete. Yeah. <laughs> oh, this is so great. Um, you mentioned um, the Recovering the U.S. Hispanic Literary Heritage Program. Would you be able to go more into that um, in the work that you're doing there? Yeah, sure. Now, I'm Carolina. So um, I'm the Director of Research of the Recovering the U.S. Hispanic Literary Heritage. And uh, the program has been around for more than 30 years already. And I grew out of a need of uh, preserving and making available all the written legacy of Latinas and Latinos in the US that was that were not being preserved in the, in the institutional or traditional archive. So we uh, we try to locate all that information. We make copies is mostly a digital, digital um, archive and uh, we have everything in there, you know, from books, cookbooks, poetry, historical documents, newspapers. We have probably one of the biggest collections of uh, newspapers published by Latinos and Latinos in the US. We have around 1500 newspapers in house. And um, we have a board composed of more than 40 uh, uh, board members from different universities around the country and different uh, fields. So uh, it's, uh, you know, and, and, uh, you know, trying to recover all the, the legacy of Cuban Americans for, uh, you know, New York weekends, et cetera. You know, so um, we also have collections of photographs, and uh, uh, and the and the and the search keeps going, right? We we keep finding and finding more stuff. Uh, last year, I was able to go to Laredo to uh, talk to um, uh, um, a lady that had a collection uh, for a long time, and uh, her family was uh, a, a family of publishers. And uh, in, in that collection only, we uh, uh, found, well, she already had, and it, it wasn't found. We saw it for the first mm -hmm. time, uh, around 50 newspapers that we didn't even know existed that were published in, in, the, in the border in Laredo, uh, you know? Uh, and so it, so this this kind of uh, discoveries keeps going, you know, keep, we keep researching. We have uh, students that work with us here we keep collecting first editions of the materials that were published, uh, and but one of our and, and uh, uh, personal collections. We have not yet um, created a survey uh, throughout the United States because that will that will be just one big grant <laughs> and a lot of work to do that. Uh, but people contact us, and through the grant aids, we receive collections uh, that that scholars are you know locating throughout the U the United States. And then we uh, bring them uh, here. I should mention that we work in a post-custodial way. Mm -hmm. We've been doing that since forever, since it was called post-custodial. <laughs> so um, and that means that we work with the, with the owners of this knowledge throughout the process. And we're very respectful about you know, returning the materials that they want back mm -hmm. or the whole collection along with digital copies so they can distribute that within their family members or do their own digital projects. Uh, that is very important uh, with, uh, you know, for us to work as partners with the community and not just uh, in the, the traditional way where scholars go and feed from the community mm -hmm. to create their own research. Uh, we, we understand that this is something uh, that needed to change. And I think I'm not mean that we're the only ones doing this. A lot of community members and community archives that work that way, uh, but very, we're very conscious about that. Uh, and not only at the beginning when we create that, you know, and we work in that um, uh, little gift that can be so cold, you know, and like a contract like, mm -hmm. uh, we are, we wrote that to accommodate and create that um, trust that needs to be created with community members at the time of sharing their, their, their knowledge, especially because they, in many cases, they have not been part of the archive. Mm -hmm. They've been, uh, you know, uh, and, uh, and, and, and the, what is, it, it's, it's uh, really sad for all of us. And for them is when they, uh, we find out that, you know, in some cases, these collections have been lost because family members, 
when they don't realize that how important it is for the, mm -hmm. the, the communities to preserve this and mm -hmm. through the work that we do together when they realize that it's mm -hmm. a very emotional moment uh, where but we've been able to in some cases to uh, help or contribute to um, find this information to the newspapers for example one of our one of uh, the donors uh, or one of the sharers of this knowledge uh, mentioned that uh, her uh, father used to publish in a newspaper uh, a newspaper so we because we have 1500 newspapers we were able to get into our databases and search and uh, you know uh, get back to the family some of this uh, legacy that was lost for them mm -hmm. so uh, and then in, in this same case we work with them throughout the process and describing you know organizing and describing the collection because they they know I mean who else knows more than it? <laughs> they don't know more than anybody about what this is, what the collection mm -hmm. is about, mm -hmm. who the person in the photograph is. So we are very, we work in a collaboratively way to, mm -hmm. uh, you know, fill all those voids. And then uh, at the moment of creating a digital project to showcase the collection, we ask them, you know, this is the vision that we have for this collection. It can be like a digital exhibit or it can be a map or something else. And uh, when we have the opportunity and uh, and we we have family members, we ask them, what do you mm -hmm. think? You know, what do you think about this? And then tell them, you know, we are choosing these colors because it's representative of us, you know? But it's all that conversation that needs to happen, that it takes longer, mm -hmm. it takes more time, but it's our responsibility as the scholars of this time to do this, to mm -hmm. do this kind of work. So, uh, um, am I missing something else? No, but just the who we are for recovering. But um, I think you covered. You can cover yeah. it, right. So yeah. the, you talked about the the need for to do recovery work mm -hmm. to document, preserve, and make yeah. available yeah. and make available mm -hmm. all the written legacy mm -hmm. of Latinas and Latinos in the U.S. from colonial times until 1980. Now. And how literature yeah, is like a. Literature. And literature is, yeah, Gabby, thank you. Yeah. So literature, for us, when we talk about recovering the U.S. literature, uh, you know, it's it's for, for us, literature is, is very broad, and it's always been this, like this. And our director, Dr. Nicolas Canelos, is truly a visionary, because he knew that we needed to incorporate certain elements from the beginning, like a cataloger to help us, you know, uh, you know describe the collections following the system, but also creating our own keywords. And uh, and uh, and I lost my train of thought. <laughs> yeah, well, how, how the literature was, it's expensive, exactly. right? Exactly, so, so, so for, the, for the description of this program, that the, these articles, for example, we were reading newspapers and indexing newspapers at an article level. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was, it's called literature, but it, for, for us, literature is very broad, like I said mm -hmm. before. It includes history, includes, uh, literary notices, um, you know, wit and humor. So we really editorial. So because these are were the ways that uh, our community was communicating and especially mm -hmm. through newspapers, it was difficult to publish. And I don't mean to say that they didn't publish, they did. Uh, but, you know, the, the way of communicating was through the newspapers, mm -hmm. you know, the politics, uh, you know, uh, civil rights, even, uh, you know, novels were published in series through the newspapers, so it was it was a very in, important way to communicate with the community, mm -hmm. and all that you know we recover. So this week, um, as you know, the students are looking at the digital humanities, um, and so I wonder for for you all, how would you define or describe the digital humanities? Well, the human digital humanities are so different from any other field, because if you say history, organic chemistry, uh, political science, even English literature, people know exactly what you're talking about, right? They, there's a very defined understanding of that field. And with digital humanities, there is no one single uh, definition. If you actually go to whatisdigitalhumanities.com, every time you refresh it, you'll get a different definition that was compiled by, um, I think it was Jason Hepler during um, Day of DH from Twitter one year. And uh, you'll see just a big range. We really like to anchor ourselves on a definition by Amanda Visconti that was, um, that talks about the digital humanities as the application 
of digital software and tools to humanity's critical thinking mm -hmm. and analysis mm -hmm. because that's really key like being mm -hmm. able to put something up on a digital platform is not digital humanities mm -hmm. you need that humanities anchor right mm -hmm. you need it to be able to think critically about the material about the way in which is represented and what is the research question that you have behind that mm -hmm. for us specifically we're also really really concerned about the ethics of portraying this material because we're working with underrepresented communities right these communities were marginalized by traditional forms of knowledge and archiving and they were not considered part of, uh, for example, US history or uh, knowledge production. And so for us, the digital humanities is really taking that step to make it accessible to mm -hmm. a wider public, right? So we're using that humanities thinking to understand who our audience is, who our community is, what has been left out, these gaps that both my colleagues talked about, you know, um, but also going back to what, um, Dr. Bayasa, um, what Gabby said, um, that we also want to make sure that our community members can create these types of projects too, that we want to use free resources, free platforms, because um, that for us is the key part of the humanities, right? Um, letting community members create their own archives or participate in the archive making to make it widely accessible so that we're not just making this for the ivory tower, mm -hmm. right? We're not just making this mm -hmm. for professors mm -hmm. and people who have their PhD or um, graduate or undergraduate students, but also for people who are interested in learning about the community for K through 12 students as well. Uh, here in Texas, we're dealing with uh, a fight against CRT where much of our history is being oppressed, right? And so as humanists, we want to make this knowledge available these archives are really important for our students to be able to see themselves represented and for other students to recognize the way in which latinos have been have always been an active part of um, the united states and the creation of culture and so for us that's how you see the humanities entering into the digital right it's, it's this um, understanding of our um, history of our culture and the ways in which we can provide the ethics um, that are necessary to make this information available. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then that's such a nice transition into my next question, which is what values or principles do you think the digital humanities holds in common? Oh, okay. So um, what, and y'all can pipe in mm -hmm. at any mo moment. Mm -hmm. um, in common with what? <laughs> Can you specify? Oh, I guess with each other. Um, or, you know, you could also speak to, if you want, um, what values or principles do you think about at USLDH in digital humanities? Do you want to start with that? And sure. Then we'll connect it. Yeah, absolutely. So for us, the, you know, I think we have like our core values have to do with uh, centering our communities in the sense that um, we are always making sure that um, those voices that we are working from, from you know, who are who are no longer here, right, or who have or, or for whom we cannot, you know, approach like a relative, right, to help us understand whether or not we are doing that that item, right, that those uh, that archive uh, justice. We want to make sure that uh, that there's context, right, uh, as associated to it, and that we are doing our best, our very best, to try to. Um, uh, center it in a way that that will allow that voice to speak uh, in a way that hopefully will you know would have been in the same manner as I mean I know that we you know that's almost nearly impossible but we try to get as close to that as possible and that's why context for us is extremely important centering our communities in the sense that we need to understand where you know our community is uh, I, when I mean our community, our, our Latino, Latina, La, Latinx community is so varied and vast, and it and it is so complex that one um, one's experience does not represent everybody in the same way as as language. So we do have to apply all kind, all you know, a long list of uh, 
of uh, it, it has to go through a, a long checklist of um, of, um, of figuring out you know how best to represent the you know those communities and and it and it falls like within the the grasp and, I, and the, the 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 name is escaping escaping me but um, this idea of uh, of being um, how, what is it the stuff that um, that our colleague at Myth works. Um, ¿Cómo se llama? Politics of care. Yeah, it's a politics of care, pero también lo que trabaja por dum. Um, you know that we that we are con oh. conscious about about the communities that we're engaged. That you know that the languages are are represented. That that our communities are treated in a respectful manner, regardless of where they are speaking from, right? Because we want to you know try to be as as aware as aware of that. Um, and then, and then also the the fact that we are working from a very precar precarious position, right? We are constantly working against the erasure of the of a historical record, you know, of where Latinos and Latinas, Latinx are not present in term not only history but literature and social, you know. And so we, you know, we want to make sure that our our communities are centered in that way. And so those are the things that we find are extremely important for us. That we are always thinking about all of those elements when we when we create a, a project right and, and before it runs before it, it's made publish uh it, it made public we uh we check to make sure that um that we're meeting as many yeah the advocacy by design that we make sure that it is feeding it that it is respectful of all those uh spaces or as many of, of those uh, uh elements right where uh, whereas we can fall into the trap of creating something that may not be useful at all to our community. So they're the, you know, and by by community, I mean like the the community who is gonna engage with the, with these materials as much, you know, or, or more, you know, the, our, our intended audience. And a lot of times, I would say that that intended audience is a, is a pretty general audience, right? And of course, you know, whenever it is a scholarly audience or an academic audience, there are other elements that we attach to the work that you know, like you know bibliography and you know and and in a language you know that, that that corresponds to those spaces but if it is a you know a general audience we make sure that that the materials are presented in a way where our community is able is is able to participate and engage in a way where they're not going to feel uh, alien to them right or that it, the, the the word doesn't speak to them at all um and you know and in, in, in and I, I I want to clarify that this does not mean that our audience, our general audience, cannot engage with academic work, but we want to make sure that that it is not worded in such a way that it is so distant from them that it doesn't represent them at all anymore, right? And so and that they don't see themselves reflected in 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 the in from that work. Mm -hmm. So I think those are the some of the things that really speak to a lot of the work that that um that we do. Yeah. And so now I think it makes more mm -hmm. sense to jump to understanding mm -hmm. the, you know, um, the principles mm -hmm. that the digital humanities have um, in common. So one of the things is that like not all digital humanities projects are constructed the same mm -hmm. or have the same guiding principles behind them. And just because a project is about or um, or or highlights an underrepresented archive, it doesn't automatically make it decolonial work or uh, resistance work or anything like that. Um, you have to be really aware of the ways, the way in which it's been been uh, executed, for example. And so that's a lot of those practices that my colleague Gabi and Carolina mentioned earlier about actually paying attention to community needs and working with community members is not the same thing as like going in and taking things from the community and making them public, mm -hmm. right? Um, so that sometimes it's a lot longer, right? To establish these relationships, mm -hmm. it doesn't happen overnight. And I know Carolina can talk a little bit more about that community work later, but um, there are different ways of approaching the digital mm -hmm. humanities. And so coming up with that methodol methodology ahead of time and understanding what are the theoretical concepts that you want to guide yourself by is really important. Mm -hmm. So um, sometimes it's really easy just to be like, oh, I found this new platform. It looks great. I'm just going to put this on there. Uh, I have all these photographs or these news clippings or whatever, uh, and not really thinking about the larger picture. Uh, there are different 
people do it in different ways, right? And so coming up with that, I think beforehand mm -hmm. is really, really important. And it's important to us because for us, the stakes are really, really high. Uh, we've definitely seen projects, both digital and in print, that misrepresent our own communities, right? That uh, for the longest time, like I said, um, Latino archives were not included in traditional archives, or if they were, they were included as um, foreign, um, like foreign material, mm -hmm. just because they were produced in, in um, Spanish, and archivists at the time didn't know what to do with them, right? And so understanding the ways in which your material is telling a story and how you want to tell that story is really important. And also recognizing when you need to step back, mm -hmm. right? Um, you cannot always be the speaker for everyone all the time. Um, sometimes you get the ball rolling or teach people. Um, we talked early ab earlier about like um, doing workshops and teaching people so that they can make their own projects. And um, knowing when you need to say, like, this is not my story to tell is really, really important. Mm -hmm. I find it really inspiring the way that you work with students. Could you talk a little bit more about how you work with students? Carlos, I think that, was that me? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> sorry. So we, you know, here at Arte Publico and the recovery, we welcome um, graduate students who come and do, you know, participate in the digital humanities work at, you know, from, from the, from, you know, from the very basic level of like helping create, you know, clean up data and scanning, you know, digitizing up to the, to the, you know, to the, uh, where they take a position where they can work off of a, of a face of a, of a digital humanities project and create their own project, right? And so when they first come in, you, you know, they, they're assigned, you know, they're assigned a position within that project. And as they develop, as they continue to work on it, usually graduate students work with us for two years or, you know, for long semesters and, and sometimes the summers. And so after the first the first semester, the second semester, we meet with them and, and find out if they're interested in taking the the project into a different way, right? Or the, you know, or how else, you know, what what else do they envision that project doing, or or they, you know, or they're you know, or they're interested in doing something else. And so a lot of times, you know, they 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 create either a project based on something that they've been working already on, or they create their own project. And so we work in uh, with graduate students in that sense, you know, giving them as much training, uh, you know, working directly with the archives, all the different, you know, steps that that, that come with working, you know, at an at an with an archive. And Carolina maybe can talk a little bit more about that, since so she supervises, uh, she's a direct supervisor of the graduate students. We also bring in um, high school stu undergraduate students through um, internships. Uh, uh, scholarship awards here through the university with the Mellon Scholars Program. Uh, there are other, there are other scholarships like academic scholarships that, that students choose to come to work with with us here at Recovery. Um, and then also um, Lula Council 60 uh, has given us up some money to provide additional scholarships right to students who are you know who are uh, Spanish speakers and who can work on specific um, uh, collections that Lula is interested in. Um, we also bring in uh, undergraduate, I mean, um, high school students in the summer. There's a, a grant that the University of Houston has been uh, giving through, um, or the, the city of Houston has given through um, uh, CER, which is CER, CER Jobs for Progress. It is a, a national organization that provides training for students who are not in, like, in, in, in uh, not attending a university. And, uh, and so, they they partner they have partnered with um, several institutions that are giving them funds to bring in uh, student high school students into the professional work field and so we we bring we have over the past three years we've brought in like eight or nine students who have worked with us over the summer high, uh, these are like you know juniors and senior students and in high school and and recently we've also started working with the K through 12 we're going Carolina and I began working with uh, um, um, fourth graders at an elementary school near our, our our university, where we are taking the archive to the students to to help with a history lesson that they're working on, which is like they have to write um, research the the like the foundational history of Texas, 
And so we've taken the archive with them. We're teaching them how to do a digital timeline using Timeline JS. You know, we have all the little fourth graders working mm -hmm. off of the same Excel sheet, you know, inputting data, erasing each other's data. <laughs> but, you know, the, the, but what is so beautiful about this is, you know, uh, these are little kids that are learning how to work in groups, like in large groups, right? Because each classroom, several uh, uh, the classrooms that we are working with, each one almost has has like 20, right? They have at least 20 students. So we have 20 students working on, on an Excel sheet at all at one time. <laughs> and and um, but they're you know learning about how that works out, you know, how do you manage the space and how do you work with each other, but also like you know, now like going like deeper into how do you select an image that best describe that best fits to your description. So for instance, they were working on the te on the Tejas missions, right? And in the the several missions that were established by the Spanish in this territory, and some one of the little kids when we first started the the lesson, they said, "Oh, you know, I don't want to work with that. Like that sounds so boring." And I said, "Yeah, I, I agree with you. You know, I don't I don't like that history as much." But you know, they then you know they were assigned a mission, they worked on it, and then I and then when it came time to for them to select an image for that mission, he's like, "Do I have to select one of like just like a church?" And I said, well, what do you think the mission represents? And he said, well, from what I read, it, it was more than a church. It was like a place of activity. You know, there were other things happening. And I said, well, why don't you try to find an image that represents that for you? And he was like, he said, am I allowed to do that? And I said, of course, because you're telling the story, right? So we really began like having a discussion about how history offers the opportunity to provide different perspectives. And, and that already is such a valuable listen to them to realize that the history that they're reading is somebody's perspective and that they in that in the uh, history should be filled with uh, various perspectives of the same story right so that you get like a better sense of what of what that story was like and so you know so we feel that you know that's that's the way that's that's what we find valuable about working with a wide range of students you know, and, and of course, the other students that, you know, I, I, I call them students like the community members in the sense that they're coming in to us to learn um, basic skills in like uh, technology. Right. Uh, and so they become students for a little bit, but then they become our, our, our teachers. Right. Because they tell us, they in turn turn around and tell us so much information about, you know, about uh, they share so much of the knowledge that they have about, you know, about different movements or different activities that were happening. And so we get to see that when we have those combinations in in the in this space of teaching and and for us, you know, we begin like with a very basic lesson, but then we begin, you know, the you know, we, we our classrooms began to be turned a little bit because we we allow for 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 that opportunity to be able to to share knowledge from from different perspectives. So but just just to mention that, that the when we have graduate and undergraduate students, we we also work with the skills that they bring. I mean, we're very like you know to reiterate what Gabby was saying, and you know, uh, they have I mean, they bring their own skills, and uh, we try to uh, you know uh, they help us in that way, and then in turn we give them training of the things that they want to learn, and uh, it, it it is we approach this in a in a very uh, like a partnership again, in the sense that, I mean, if they want to learn about a software in specific and we know how to use it, we learn together and we do the training. And if we don't know, you know, we learn together. We find someone to teach us how that works or we find a tutorial online and we get together and, you know, we all learn the same thing. Uh, so that, that's something that we try to do with the students. We, we do have projects that we develop here. Like the projects are developed here and they, they need to be finished in that sense. But then we allow for them to have a voice too. And every single project that is, uh, every every single student that touched a person that touched a project, their name is attached to it. Uh, you know, so they have something to to come back to to put in their resume. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we encourage them to finish at least a portion of a project, so they have something to show and say, you know, this is what I did, or a blog post or something like that, so they can refer to that in the future. Mm -hmm. I love this. And in your site, your website is filled with so many great projects. Um, can you share um, a few of the projects that the students have created? 
Sure. Um, actually, let me share my screen just to. I put a little PowerPoint presentation oh. there that has a bunch of different projects there. Where did you put it? I put oh, it in there we go. Yeah. Okay, cool. So let me just click on that and I'll share my screen so that we can um, look at some. So these are all done in collaboration. We um, usually, amongst the three of us, or you know, sometimes one or other one of uh one of us have an idea for a project and then um, assign certain tasks to students so that they can all learn um some students come with more uh, knowledge than others most don't have digital humanities training so they learn a lot of that here and i hope I'm not so it's gonna be right yeah it's gonna be below yeah there's it starts if you go a little bit down uh, there's a bunch right there go yeah you can go okay and there's a bunch after that. Oh, what just happened? You stop sharing. Here we go. All right. So um, one of the things we highlight a lot are um, archives. So digital archives. We use Omeka a lot to create these archives and distribute the work so that students can do scanning or um, create metadata on spreadsheets. We always talk about how the spreadsheet is basically the backbone of the project, right, so that they can learn how to appropriately describe um, materials and also what are kind of the traditional ways of describing things using Library of Congress subject terms, and also to think about the ways in which those subject terms are often like lacking, especially if they're related to non-Anglo-American um, materials. So we also have key terms that are more accessible to the public that can allow people to browse and search for different items. Um, this is an example of Feminismo Internacional, which is a um, feminist newspaper. And we have an image here of uh, Elena Arismendi, who is the editor and publisher. And so these types of projects really highlight, um, for example, all the work that women did um, for American culture, for literary culture, for feminism, and, you know, give us a window that is often, or like I said, fill in those gaps that um, you might not get in your K through 12 or even college experience unless you have access to the archives. Mm -hmm. um, we use Spanish language metadata as well, again, because a lot of these um, projects or, or archives are originally in Spanish, so it doesn't really make sense to just describe them in English. Uh, we want to make sure that our community can engage with it, um, so we try to do everything bilingual whenever possible. Mm -hmm. And then that also like uses different student skills, right? If a student has stronger Spanish-speaking skills, they can help write that. Um, we do also like to give students the opportunity if they're like they don't have it super strong, they might try their hand at it. And then we have another student revise it. And so there's a lot of collaboration here. Um, we do network analysis as well. This is something that's currently in progress, the network of women in, in Hispanic periodicals. It really shows who was publishing where and how they're connected. And it's really exciting to see this just giant network of uh, writers come together. We've done this just for the women, and our, we have a larger one that is all the um, authors in the newspapers that we've collected, and then this other subset that is just women to just highlight the types of work that they've um, that they conducted. Uh, we also have had students do um, exhibits based on collections, and so we have collections on Omeka that um, you can like really browse, and then exhibits which are more specific and detail something in a collection. These are two exhibits about the same collection, which is really cool because you have different students have like different visions, depending on what their background is. That's exactly what Gato said earlier, that every student brings their own um, knowledge into the equation. And so one student did, one um, graduate student did this introduction on the right that gives you a kind of snapshot of who Angela de Hoyos was, um, how she was a writer, a poet, and a Chicana activist, as well as um, an artist. And on the left, we have a exhibit by a art history undergraduate who focused on the ways in which this, uh, in which uh, Angela de Hoyos portrayed beauty. And so it's really neat to see like different people are gonna interact with the dark archive in different ways. 
before you jump on that one, yeah. Lore, can you go back? And, yes. and this one is it's a it's a really uh, important example for us because when the the owner of the collection came to us, who is uh, um, the, her um, Angela de Hoyos is uh, husband um, Moises, he gave us a he gave us a copy of the collection. He wanted to make sure that his wife uh, was not only re uh, remembered and known as the uh, as a Chicana poet, you know that, that we all know her as, but because she, you know, uh, she was way more than that. And so um, in the past, when we, you know, when we did publish, we did publish um, a, a, a a collection like an edited collection, selected poems of, of of her work, right from the archives and from like all of the other books that we had uh, previously published. And so that was done. And so this, this really allowed us to showcase and, and, and really began to show the, 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 the range and the breadth of work that is, that is being done, that is being done, that is being done by, uh, by, by, uh, by, uh, by an activist, right? And by a writer here in Houston, here in, in the US, you know, that these writers are, are not, um, are, you know, they, especially like within the literary word, world, these uh, these poets uh, and these these um, these writers were really activists for their communities, right? And so having these students work on 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 their on, on this poet from different perspectives is is allowing us to showcase you know this other other elements that we wouldn't have been able to do otherwise just because the text um, is very limiting, right? It it just you know it doesn't allow us to showcase this. That's great. Uh, and we also published um, her work as well. So if you're interested in reading her poetry, you can check mm -hmm. out her book on um, at the mm -hmm. .com. So that's kind of cool that you have like all these different aspects of, of this author. Um, we also have a uh, collaboration with the League of the United Latin America. American citizens, LULAC. Um, if you don't know about them, they are the largest and um, longest lasting and first, I believe, um, mm -hmm. national um, civil, rights. civil rights organization for Latinos in the United States. And one of the projects we, or collaborations we did was create a digital timeline to show or really highlight the, their formation and many of the um, highlights of, of their organization. And they funded various undergraduates to help work on this. So they did the research, they did the writing, wrote an English and Spanish version, and this is available both on our site and on their site as well. And we've continued the collaboration with them to do community archiving projects, as well as um, to fund other scholarships for undergraduate students. And this one was also done in English and Spanish mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. yeah, and this one's Timeline JS, which is the same mm -hmm. um, software that is being used with the uh, fourth graders. With the fourth grade. Yeah. Um, uh, we also have Arte Publico Press Digital, and this is where we have e-texts, and these are interactive um, texts. So it's like a book, but then you can click for um, access to different sites, or you know, instead of having just the plain footnote, you'll be able to, I don't know who this person is. And mm -hmm. in some cases you'll be able to click and, and um, visit a page, uh, but you can also annotate it. So it's really great for the classroom. Um, people can have discussions in the margins so that you're not reading in isolation. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have a new project um, that's ongoing right now. It's in Proyecto de la Literatura Puertorriqueña, the Puerto Rican Literature Project. Uh, it is a recent Mellon funded project that seeks to highlight uh, Puerto Rican poets, both on the archipelago and in the diaspora. It's going to contain poetry. Uh, many will be in English and Spanish, as well as having uh, biographies of many of the poets as well. Do you want to add anything to this? Yeah. The, you, why don't you tell them it stems from the one of the grants in aid? Oh, yeah. yeah. It stems from one of the grants in aid. Um, Claire Jimenez, who is currently at the University of South Carolina. Yes. Yeah. Uh, she um, was one of our grantees a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. our, I think our first year. And so it was really exciting that she was able to expand this. And so uh, we see how our grants and aids are really like expanding and continuing to grow, that it's not just one little thing and then it ends, but um, that it continues to have a life on its mm -hmm. own and launch these careers for other um, um, 
um, scholars as well and community mm -hmm. members and students. Uh, you can find our projects at bibliopress.com slash digital dash humanities, and we'll share that link mm -hmm. as well. These are a couple of other examples, um, network analysis, a, um, a map. So we do mapping as well. So this one specifically shows uh, small historical societies, libraries, and museums that have or may have Hispanic materials in their collections. And so this is a great place for researchers if they were going to make a research trip, for example, if they're looking for Hispanic mm -hmm. collections in their area, they can kind of get an idea of where they can find things and what types of materials are there, as well as the contact information if we were able to find it, so that they can, you know, really plan out their trips. Uh, we also may I, may I add something yeah. really short about this one? Yes. But this is really interesting, you know, because our projects are open and Gabby was talking about this. Uh, um, the the creating the community through the through the spreadsheet that we created for people uh, to add their projects. When we work with, with the community, and this is like a really proud moment, uh, one of the community historians, the community, Lula community historians, um, took ownership of the page. He said, "Can I add to this?" And it's, we said, <laughs> "Yes, of course." And he created more tasks and more things, and he added all the Lula newsletters to the list. You know, and that's amazing because it means that. It truly is a collaboration that we are open in these spaces and people are using it more than open, you know, that people really are using it. In this case, in this specific project with the, with the small societies and archives, uh, we have had small historical societies contacting us afterwards mm -hmm. saying, oh, we saw your map and uh, can we add our, our, our you know, our institution or a small society that is in such place? And they, uh, we, of course, we add it, you know, but this, is to speak about that we're, we're breaking that, trying to break the circle and people are, are, are you know, are um, trusting us mm -hmm. at the end and trusting us with this. Yeah. Uh, we also do Twitter bots to help kind of populate Twitter with different information. Um, the one seen here, filling the gaps, really tweets out stuff about um, different authors. It'll say so-and-so published in this newspaper. Do you know more? Um, so and so published this in this year, et cetera. So it really just kind of helps you learn about different um, Hispanic authors at different times in the United States. We also have one for the Alonso Esperales collection, which um, actually draws from his writings. He was a uh, one of the first Mexican American lawyers to practice in the United States. He was a World War I veteran, and he was a co-founder of LULAC, as well as a civil rights activist. And so it'll just tweet out stuff, you know, in his writings. It's always very present. Um, I always say that it's it's a, almost a little uncanny or creepy, but <laughs> when something happens politically, I feel like that Twitter bot tweets something out mm -hmm. that's really, really, really important to the present moment. Mm -hmm. um, so it really tells you how groundbreaking and important his work was and how we need to continue that um, work and how it's still relevant today. Mm -hmm. So all, all this information, all these archives are still relevant to the work that's being done today by current activists. Okay. That's the community? Yeah, no, my name is Carolina. Yeah, yeah, why don't you show that one so that Carolina can help me? Wow, this is so great. Uh, so many inspiring examples. Um, and you talked a lot about community. Um, would love to hear more on what your approach is to working with community. Yeah, I, th I think that we have mentioned, you know, throughout the presentations, how we try to create a partnership. And uh, and uh, it's critical at this moment, too, you know, that where erasure is happening again in history, you know, the little gains that we have uh, made uh, through the process is okay. It's, uh, it's you know, it's uh, it, it looks like we're going backwards again. So it's really important that we put this information and this history, the stories out there again. And for that, we have partnered with the with community members and uh, we have talked about Lulac City, the, the historical Lulac here in Houston. And, um, they have they have been when well, they're they're called the historical lulac so they're very receptive of the work that we're doing because it works in so many levels not just recording the history but also training the new generations of scholars mm -hmm. and possibly archi archivists and Gabby mentioned said and our partnership with said and Bank of America and they and and these students that come here uh, high school students 
they don't know if they truly you know want to continue going to the to the university or college or or if if they're gonna you know or they don't know what the feel is you know they come with an idea and when they are confronted to this and working with us it's like something open up and and they're like feel committed and many of them is like I'm, I'm going to college and I'm going to study history or, or I'm going to study literature or I'm going, I'm going to be a lawyer, you know, and, and that happens a lot here. And, and this is specific event. This is the first event that we did in the community. Uh, we received, uh, as, as uh, Laura mentioned before, the, the, the archive for the uh, founder of LULAC, Alonso Perales. Mm -hmm. And it was a, a major, a major uh, collection coming to us. Uh, it was, uh, you know, other universities of the archive were trying to or get to this, you know, and preserve it. But the family truly wanted this collection to be open and out there. So uh, they trusted us with processing the collection, you know, and, and making it available. Because we, since we are nonprofit and we are uh, an independent archive, a community archive, we can do things that is more complicated than other type of archive, right? So we we put everybody, we all of us work on processing this collection and make it available. Alonso Perales preserve every little piece of paper. Um, and uh, he kept communications, the, not only the letters that he received, but the copy, carbon copies of the letters that he sent. So it's really important because it helps us to understand how civil rights work during that time. So we decided, and the collection came with artifacts. And the first constitution of LULAC is a draft. So it's a, so it's a very rich. So we decided to do uh, a, a digital project in Omeka, an exhibit, and then to present it in the community. So for LULAC, Lulac uh, 60 was our partner at that time. So we we went to the community. We brought a pop-up exhibit with uh, some of the Alonso Perales uh, items. Uh, his daughter was present, and she's she's in one of the pictures. His gra uh, his great granddaughter was there, the little girl. So it was very, uh, you know, uh, telling about the, the the work that we can all do together. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, students, uh, you know, professors, archivists, community members, community historians, so all coming together to uh, to make this collective these histories, these stories available to the community again. So Lulek uh, decided that they wanted to keep, uh, you know, uh, helping us in that sense. And like Gabby mentioned before, they've been providing scholarship for students. And as a matter of fact, we have a meeting with them in a few weeks because they, they want to keep donating and, uh, and, you know, and contribute in that sense. And uh, we provided with them uh, scholarships. The first time that we they provided these this, uh, intern, internships, we had around 11 students uh, applying for that, right? Mm -hmm. And then last year for the call, we received 33 applications. So uh, that makes them very happy and us very happy, you know, because uh, it's, it's a great way to try to change the system, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> to try to provide our scholars, you know, to train our scholars, uh, you know, so they can um, uh, continue their work out there. Uh, we also, you know, are, are actively working with, the, uh, we work throughout the country, but we work with our immediate community. We work with LULAC National too. And now we're gonna help LULAC National to digitize their whole national collection. Uh, so that's something big that's coming our way. And they will pay for the students to do that work. So that, that uh, that's, uh, that's a big plus for our students. Um, we do public uh, programming and we did, uh, uh, Digital archiving day, uh, an archiving day with the community that uh, Lula was pushing really hard to do. So, and it was very successful. We received around five collections just that day, and uh, and and we're pro preparing the next one to work with them. And that says again, and and then there you see how uh, again that that I that trust right that mm -hmm. people are coming with the collections yeah. because they have heard that we. Uh, work in a, I mean, it, it's all, I mean, it's, it's common sense. Work in a respectful way. It should be the way that it should be, right? It, mm -hmm. it, we <laughs> should be respectful of our, everybody. Mm -hmm. So it's it's kind of, you know, I don't know, difficult for me to think about it because it's, it's the way that, just the way they should be. But people learn about this and they come and they come with their family collections there. And uh, Gabby, maybe at the end, can talk a little mm -hmm. bit about the apron that uh, one of the community members brought because it's, it's, it's such a beautiful story. 
uh, but uh, you know that's that's uh, the kind of programming that we do in the community. And then we re we're receiving these collections of very important civil rights um, uh, attorneys. You know, mm -hmm. they are donating the collection to us, and and uh, we decided to go to the Mexican American Bar Association. We're a profit, so the the archival materials needed to preserve the collections are expensive. Mm -hmm. So. Um, we digitize them, but we need to rehouse them too. Mm -hmm. So we went to Mava. We learned that that they have some money to give away, and we talked to them, and we gave us you know money to pay for a student and for to buy all the equipment that we needed to process this kind of collection. So our community members are ready to to contribute to this, and I think um, you know we, we just need to open up the spaces and 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 be ethical and respectful about it. And uh, this, I think this is the way that archives to function in the future. You know, things uh, things are changing and we'll see, you know, how, how that works. But we have learned and we have found on the way many archives last hours that have been working in the community. And, 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 and just to go back to what Gabby was saying at the beginning, we we, we thought about this idea of, of, uh, of creating a hub because they are working. I mean, this is not new. Communities and families are archiving their stories, but if, when they create digital projects, most of them disappear mm -hmm. because there is not sustainability attached to it. And this yeah. is something that we think that we can provide. Uh, you know, if not partnering with them, at least uh, you know, uh, creating these spaces for preservation. Yeah. But if you can talk about that, that. Uh, Apron. Yes. Yeah. Well, let me yeah, let me so share good. the like, the way I can share this image that we have of the apron. Do we, we still have time, Pauline? Uh, yes. If you guys do, I, okay. I know we're over, so I really appreciate your generosity. All right. Uh, we okay. can't leave without talking about the apron. <laughs> okay. So, can you, so can you see that? So yes. So um. In all the work that we've been doing, you know, all these years, and you know, from the like from the academic perspective, and studying like what what archives mean, right, and in the whole recovery of the of this literature, and and as we recover the literature, the history, we recovered the communities, right, who did not see themselves represented in in these spaces of power, and and uh, and it's really hurtful because we still see it in in the students, especially here in Texas. You know where students continue to feel that they're you know second second class uh, citizens who don't really feel that they have the same rights or they don't have access to the same uh, resources that are offered to other students you know other you know non minority uh, kids in in the in in Texas and so um, one of the things that we have always been working at you know at you know I, I know that like for Carolina and myself it has been our mission to kind of not kind of, but really to try to work towards um, um, repairing and, and, and creating more of those spaces where our community does feel welcome and where they feel that that their stories matter. And so um, and so that's why you know we continue to go back, you know, go even further into into now into the the elementary schools. And so when we did this community event, we knew that our that um, the people that would be coming in to to share some of their stories with us and some of their archives, we're going to bring, you know, important, valuable uh, um, items that were meaningful to them, you know, letters and photographs, you know, uh, somebody brought in a Bible that in, that had all of her mother's or all of her mother's like mementos, like very special mementos, you know, uh, put between like the pages of the Bible, the Bible that would sit right next to her, to her uh, bedside table. And so that was given to us, you know, as an, as an item that, that, you know, that we need to, you know, uh, digitize and take care of, et cetera. Uh, but this this item that was given to us um, belongs to uh, the mother of uh, of, uh, of Gracie Sign, who is a, a local activist uh, politician, you know, who ran for the for one of the first female Latinas to run for mayor here in Houston. And and this really like consolidated to me what it means to do the work that we're doing, where we see uh, a member of our community bring to us an apron that belonged to her mother that really like documents the work that her mother was doing at home to take care of the family, to take care of the community, because this this family and this this woman specifically, what she represented for the community was like the 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 one person who, who had come to the United States and had sort of like made it and was the resource that could provide information to other people who were planning on coming to the US. Uh, 
this she represented. So in its in a in a big sense, she's you know she's uh, symbolizes this this very like motherly figure who is providing a lot of nutritional support, you know, in in many ways, right, to to her community. But anyway, the receiving the apron means to to us that our community are, are, is seeing the value of saving uh, elements that are part of their history that otherwise you know that if, if that if a space like us didn't exist they wouldn't be able to to you know to place their items there because in those spaces these items would be considered uh not important not relative not valuable but now we're seeing our community taking care of these of these items that are valuable to them and bringing them to us and and um and uh, um you know giving us a responsibility to take care of them for future generations so that we get to tell the stories of these community members that are instrumental in the in making you know uh, the U.S. into what it is, and so you know as we talk through the you know through the story of, of the apron, you know it's it, it, uh, as you can tell it's an apron that has been well worn. You know uh, it has uh, the grease stains from the beans that the mother used to cook to feed the family. Um, you know it's something that was that was useful, but it's also historical and it really documents right. The, the lived experience of our Latino community. And, and, uh, and you know, it was very moving. It's, it's important for us to continue to do this type of work to serve as that space where our community continues to, to feel that they are being seen, that be, they are being heard, that they hopefully will not turn around and throw away things, that, things because they think that, that they don't matter to anybody because they matter to us. They matter, they really matter to us. And we will do our very best to center those stories, to document them, to save them so that we don't have to have a recovery program 20 years from now that has to go back and, and, and look for this history so that our, you know, so that our communities um, you know, feel represented. And I and, and when I say this, I, I know that uh, like I said, we model ourselves with the work that uh, collections as data, I mean uh, I'm sorry, collect uh, Color Conventions is doing, you know, at whom other communities, other ethnic communities across the U.S. because we are, you know, in a very precarious situation. And so we see that this is, you know, this is something that is not only happening to Latinos in the U.S., but it's it's part of, a, of, an, of an idea of, of who gets to tell what stories and what stories matter. And, and, and we're done with that. You know, we want to make sure that, all, you know, the more stories, just like the little boy that, that couldn't believe that there could be more than one ways to tell the story of the mission is that's what we want our, our, our people to know. There, there are there are so many ways to tell these stories. They are all valuable because they are, are, are they are all telling the same story pretty much. But we the more perspective that we get that we have, the richer that history will be, right? The richer that we and the richer that we will be for having all of those stories. Um, so. Let me stop. So the the name of the mother is uh, Guadalupe Guadalupe um, Cortez. Mm -hmm. Wow! Uh, thank you so much for sharing your amazing work. It's so inspiring to hear your approach to working with community and and the amount of trust that you're building with your community and the amount of care that you put into it and the collaboration and the way that you're approaching um, history. So thank you so much for talking with us today. It's been really inspiring to hear about your work. Thank, thank you, you, Pauline. Thank you for having us. <laughs> thank you so much.